Hello and welcome to the Data and AI podcast. We're on episode two already, and I'm very, very excited to welcome David Reed to this second episode. Welcome, David. Thank you so much for for, for being on this podcast. Um, so, so David is the Chief Knowledge Officer for Data IQ. You've got you've got a fascinating uh, career history, and I've been really, really excited for this podcast. I know it's, it's, it's been in, uh, a long time in the making, and we're talking about one of our favorite topics, data literacy. Um, so David, do you want to start off, introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about yourself as well? Thank you, Razim. Delighted to be joining you and to uh, be part of the inaugural series of your podcast. Uh, yes, so in my role as Chief Knowledge Officer at Data IQ, people might see me on stage as the face of Data IQ at events like the launch of our Data IQ 100 list or our awards, which we do annually. Uh, in fact, with the 100 list twice annually because you now have a US edition. Uh, but in terms of my career, I started off as a journalist, principally writing about direct marketing when that was a, a really hot topic. And of course, that progressively got digitized. Uh, and then in 2005, I started to write about data exclusively as the editor of a monthly magazine called Data Strategy. When in 2011, um, DataRQ was launched, I got employed as, as staff member number one. Uh, and since then, we've really followed the evolution of the industry from being very much sort of back office to a front office star, if you will, a box office star to where we are now. And Data IQ itself has evolved. So alongside those, those events uh, that people know and, and the uh, outputs that we create, we're also a membership business. So we work with organizations to try and uh, connect them into a, a network of like-minded peers to develop their personal and professional skills uh, for the data leaders right down to the practitioner level. And uh, yes, as you kindly mentioned, I also wrote a book. I don't like to talk about it very often. Um, <laughs> Becoming Data Literate, which uh, came out in 2000, uh, sorry, in 2021. Fantastic. And yeah, I have to say, David was kind enough to, 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 to give me his book today. And I can't wait to, can't wait to read it. I've, I've definitely read snippets of it, but I can't wait to read the whole thing as, as, as we, as we go, go through. And, and, and I have to say with data IQ as someone who's, who's been a practitioner in data for about 15 odd years, um, the most helpful thing is I went through my journey and my career progression was the networking and, and to meet like-minded individuals and just, just sit down and say, actually, you know what, it's quite hard, isn't it? Um, and, and I think that's where Data IQ has absolutely excelled, getting the right people in the room to, to have those uh, meaningful conversations. Well, I appreciate you saying that because it is something that we very definitely focus on, recognizing how isolated senior data leaders can feel uh, even within their own organizations, because data is is not a mature function yet. It has not been around as long as marketing or sales or even HR. Uh, so it's on a journey and it can be difficult to navigate uh, if you are given that task of, of running the data office or running the provider of services in, into those clients, because there's there's no standardized roadmap. Yeah, yeah. If you look at the profiles in our 100, the routes people have taken into those senior jobs are so diverse and it makes it difficult to sit there with confidence, go, this is exactly what I should do. Yeah. So we're trying to be part of developing that shared data culture yeah. uh, and giving people support and networking and a toolkit to work out what they should do yeah. when they log in each yeah. day. Exactly right. Exactly right. And I, th I think a big part of uh, the culture, and I know we've we've spoken about this previously as well. A big big part of creating a data culture in an organisation is is in fact data literacy, right? Um, and it's 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 and there's so many different facets to data literacy. There's so much just written about it, um, and 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 there's lots of different definitions of it. What what's what is data literacy for you? What's the definition of it? Well, it's always a good point uh, to go to first principles and say, well, what are we actually talking about? And in many cases, the, the definition of data literacy that was around a couple of years back was not that different from a definition of just literacy. Uh, so it was the ability to, to, to read, understand, and communicate with data. And that's important, and that, that, that goes a certain distance. But on top of that, we have adopted a definition that talks about a shared mindset and behaviors that draw you towards things like evidence-based decision-making, uh, to having ways of working that are common across the organization that assume that a shared and trusted data asset is going to be in place. And getting to the point where that's almost 
transparent. So you don't have to go and shout for it and pull on a lever. It will be there. And I think if you can get to that position, you might not just call yourself data literate, but actually potentially data native, which, by the way, was going to be the original title of the book. Oh, really? Uh, originally, I was going to call it um, the data natives, the new tribe and the people who lead them. But uh, I thought it was a little... Book. <laughs> it could be the second book. It very much could be the second book. But that felt a little bit too far ahead of the curve. Yeah. Uh, so I thought about, you know, data literacy was just becoming a fairly commonly used term. Mm. And uh, fairly simultaneously, Michelle Obama put out her book called Becoming. And I was hoping people might just drunkenly type into Amazon the word becoming and it would autofill becoming data literate and <laughs> would increase my sale. So, Did it? <laughs> uh, well, uh, the first edition sold out. Yeah. So, you know, it, it worked. Fantastic. Fantastic. <laughs> Um, and, and so you, you, you talk about the, the journey to become data native or, or a data literate organization. Yeah. Mm. Now, often the, the I, it's not a mistake, it's definitely a facet of it. Often when I'm talking to people, when you talk about data literacy, they immediately think, ah, training. Yeah. Um, and and that's, that's where the mind first goes to. But it, it's, it's more than training really, isn't it? And, and I wonder if you could talk about those different facets to, to how could you become a data literate organization? Yeah, absolutely. And you're right, there is a big focus on training. We ourselves deliver a lot of training that, that talks about things like uh, storytelling with data because that is important. Um, if you're going into a business where the majority of your stakeholders are not as obsessed with data and with the models that you've built and the statistical probability of the predictions you're making, you've got to find a way to communicate the value and the impact it's going to have. So step one, yes, is to start to develop some of those soft skills and, and become a good communicator and somebody who's able to engage with the stakeholders. But then outside that, the, uh, the people consuming data, they need to have a, a mindset that expects to find trusted insights which supports their decision making and to push back uh, if they don't feel that's what they're getting but also to want to be measured on the effectiveness of the outcomes of those decisions. So you create a feedback loop, which says, if we feed in this data, develop this insight, it supports a decision that's made, and we track that through to the outcome. Did it improve the decision-making process? And can we fine-tune that? And tuning, I think, is a very important facet to what people do with data and what's happening right now in the world of data. We will probably talk about that <laughs> shortly. Um, and data literacy is, is partly about just understanding, tuning your own business behaviors so that you do take account of these, these things. Now, a very important dimension to that is it doesn't remove taking decisions. Yep. The answer is not in the data. The data is an evidence-based and I think at the very top levels of business, if you're going to be a, a CEO, for example, you're going to have to make some very tough calls and sometimes just go against what the data says because there may be other factors at work. So data literacy is about saying, it's there, I get it, I've understood it, I've thought it through, and now I'm going to act on it. Yep. What that action is, data can't tell you. Yep. Yeah, exactly right. I think I, I certainly, well, I'm, I'm seeing that in my role at the moment as well, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm a data person. I'm, I'm now in the role of the, of the CEO. So I'm very massively data driven. But sometimes you're in that position, you've got the data as evidence, but your gut's telling you something from your experience. And then you're kind of battling with the data or you're trying to find the answer in the data, yeah, yeah. which actually becomes quite tricky. And there is a cultural shift in that. You have to, you have to take people on a, on a cultural journey of, of getting, um, uh, to 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 use the data a little bit more, use it as a as a as a prop as well as their experience. What have you seen works well in organisations? So, uh, like in 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 respect to how do you win those senior business leaders over in terms of right? Okay, you know what? This isn't this isn't here to take over your job. This isn't here to give you all the answers. But how do you how do you take a business user on that journey then? Yeah, that that's one of the key challenges for people who work in data. Uh, it's one of the key challenges for, for business leaders generally because um, if you look at, there's a generational shift, right? right. Let, let's, let's be honest. Yeah. Uh, and certainly, you know, when you look like this and you're my age, almost none of this stuff was around at the point when I entered the workforce. Uh, we were just starting to see 
you know, PCs landing on desks to the point now where, of course, data it saturates our personal lives. Um, and I think that's part of how you tackle that problem that you just outlined. You know, if you say to someone, how did you choose the restaurant that you ate in last night or the playlist that you listened to? or the, uh, the thing you just ordered off of that e-commerce site. You did a bit of data analysis, and it may have swayed you, or you might have decided, no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna trust my gut or my personal preference around something and see how that plays out. So when talking to those senior decision makers, part of the job is to go, um, you can trust this evidence, uh, and we want you to bring your skills to play. A few years ago, the idea of gut feeling instinct got a very bad press mm -hmm. from the vendors uh, and the consultancies um, of data analytics mm -hmm. because they were saying, "No, no, you, you know, you shouldn't work like that. You have to That's just right. draw more data. data driven. You need to, yeah, I yeah, remember that. It was yeah. all about data, being fully data driven yeah. um, and." Uh, throwing shade on on people who weren't and organizations yeah. that weren't. And investors, of course, picked up on that um, and do increasingly look for how data-driven an organization is. And that's that's all, all well and good. But that will never remove all the other things that an organization uh, needs to be good at and is good at and has to demonstrate skills around. It's just that probably across all of those functions, data is now playing a part and increasingly a transparent mm. part. So it, it's not that uh, you create a process or you reach a decision point and then you get the data for it. It just becomes inherent in all of that. It will just be in the conversation mm -hmm. from the start. Data will be at the table in some form or another. And I'm sure, you know, Wazim, in your own career, you, you know, you've seen that shift happen. Yep. And the sort of reports you're looking at now as a CEO uh, probably just feel much easier to absorb. Yep. Uh, and you probably feel you spend less time having to challenge the numbers or argue about, is that what we mean by a customer? <laughs> and, uh, or is that what we're going to put in our report? This, this, do we trust that number? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. yeah. um, it's now, how do we play that out in a, in a strong narrative for our employees, for our shareholders, for, for our suppliers, for our customers, whatever the audience is. Yeah, yeah. That's what I think is really, really exciting, is, is just reaching that point where the, the boundary between data, the data office and the business starts to blur. Yeah. So you know, you'll, you'll see this uh, in the book, we talk about organizational structures because that's still a challenge. Um, but a lot of large organizations, as they become more mature, federate, especially the analysts and the data scientists. And by that, I mean, they sit with a business stakeholder. They are part of the decision and part of the teams that are working in marketing or logistics or pricing or risk. They're not a centralized function that someone has to go and knock on the door and say, excuse me, can you do something for me? Yeah. Uh, that is all in under this sort of heading of becoming data literate, becoming data driven. And, and and how do you how do you when you're going through this journey and you're 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 setting up your data function and you're you're um, trying to win the business over when when you're quite early into that journey how do you how do you demonstrate value fast because data literacy is one of those things which if if the organization if i if i may say is immature in in this in in, in the world of data and digital they'll see it as a nice to have mm. and they'll be like oh it's part of the training function or the l and d function how 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 would you suggest or what would be your tips um around proving the value of 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 putting data literacy at the forefront of your data strategy well it's a great question to ask because actually you know it's not an argument that's been won uh, and in fact there's quite a lot of rollback uh, on, on some of the progress that, that we've seen across the last decade where data is no longer a standalone function. It's becoming a, a subset of technology, mm -hmm. uh, which, by the way, we don't approve of. <laughs> but for a simple reason that it, it inhibits what data is able to do for an organization. It, it, it constrains the transformative potential that data can have um, through what you might do 
with analytics and data science and process re-engineering. Um, so how you embed that into an organization and, and, and get that, that buy-in, the data strategy has to be fully aligned with the business strategy. Mm -hmm. it, it can't ignore it. It can't just be about let's create perfect trusted data products. Uh, let's have a, a wonderful data office with all the right numbers of people doing the right things. It has to talk the language of the business and say, if the goal of the organization is to achieve this over this timeline, here are the points at which data will support that. And to do that, we need these things to happen. Mm -hmm. We need this funding, we need this, and some of it will be training, or we need this engagement from the stakeholders. We need to see the behavioral change happen. And if it doesn't, not only will the data strategy fail, but the business strategy will fail. And a really interesting thing that's starting to emerge out of that is you know, how do you tie uh, effectiveness of the board, which is a thing that gets reported on now at the PLC level, how do you tie in data to that mm -hmm. to say, well, how effective have they been um, in using these assets and demonstrating the value creation? It's something we're looking at quite closely at DataIQ to see how we can support that. So if you're quoting in your annual report your use of data and analytics and you're trying to demonstrate how data-driven you are, part of that uh, has to feed off the increased data literacy in the business and respecting the fact you've got to take the workforce with you, you've got to take your supply chain with you, you have to have everyone on, on board with this move. Mm -hmm. Now, not everyone wants that, right? Let's be honest, sure. not everyone's going to get it, not everyone needs to be at the same level. Mm -hmm. But going right back to that starting point about in our personal lives, we're all using these tools, we're yeah. all using data. If you can make it feel the same way in business, then I think you start to win. Yeah, yeah. And and I think I think I think there's some there's some really fundamental points in that around around. I I always see data as one of, uh, especially as I've I've kind of transitioned roles as one of the things in my toolbox. And maybe a bit of a weird way of thinking about it, but but uh, yes, I've got my experience. Yes, I've got the knowledge and experience of of our non execs around the table. I've got friends like yourself who I can turn to, but then I've also got the data as another element in my yeah. toolbox to help me to say, okay, right, this is where I want to take the business. This, here's where the direction goes. And I think I think that journey to that is so important and data has such a fundamental part to play in it. Um, how, how do you, so so how do you embed that at Data IQ? So, so actually, um, I, I, I love- Are, are we data question. literate? Well, so, I'd, so, love to, yeah. I'd love to say that we yeah. are, but no, we're probably, you know, it's, it's, like, uh, it's like cobbler's children have the worst shoes. You yeah. know? And <laughs> I, I wouldn't like to claim that, that our own use of the toolkits uh, is as advanced as it could be. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we're working on it like, like everyone else and like any organization that's grown organically and whose market has shifted significantly, um, we're, we're perhaps, getting there we know we may be a level two or three on a on a scale out of five uh, can we jump forward quicker uh, and get better perhaps perhaps but just to to the point you're making there, i mean you think about it in a sports context mm -hmm. so most of the large clubs have adopted analytics yep uh, so they're looking right from when they're scouting um you know the whole money ball concept <laughs> although there are certain large clubs who just don't seem to worry about whether they yeah. can make a profit on uh, the players that they hire and then sell. Um, but they're looking for players who are going to make a difference within the team. Uh, they look at their training stats. Uh, they look at their player stats, you know, all of that, which also is available, you know, a lot of that just to individuals through uh, the joys of sports betting, not advocating for that, by the way, um, but it's certainly out there. However, that's only part of what the coaching staff and the managing staff and the sporting directors um, are doing mm -hmm. to, to create a, a team that wins matches and wins titles and wins cups. You still have to have all of the people management. Yep. You have to have the dietitians. Yep. You have to have, you know, the grounds are making sure that people don't injure themselves during training. Um, and the whole thing starts to loop back. So, you know, one organization, one, one uh, set of people that we know really well who created a, um, 
a consumer app for cricket and people can track their own scores and their training and they can do video analysis and they can gradually improve using things that five years ago were the preserve of national teams and it's now right down at grassroots level. Uh, that's very exciting and transformative. But it doesn't take away that, you know, if you don't strap on the right pads and you don't put your fielders in the right place and uh, you don't consider the weather and uh, the, the mood of your team and how the opposition played last time, you know, that's not all data. Yeah, no, okay, yeah, I, c I completely see that. And your, your kind of, your, your, your reference to um, sports teams and, and how they operate, I've, I've done some work for a football club previously and I think it was it was fascinating I went in there with with kind of eyes closed a little bit I was just like this is really exciting I'm not a football fan massive football fan myself but I was like oh I'll get to learn but I was I was so pleasantly surprised to see how data thirsty they were um, from the sports science people who were taking players through the academy mm. taking into account where people where, where where these academy players are going through the growth spurt and what kind of training regime diet they need to have it was they were data thirsty at that point. They had a lot of science behind it, but they really needed the data to 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 predict and 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 go into that kind of space. Um, and one thing that, that 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 kind of led on from that was how do they keep up to date with the latest kind of innovations and and what's happening in the world. So a big big part of what I did with them was actually how to how to keep in touch with what the market's doing, whether that's through events uh, like Data IQ or, or or other events that happen across across the globe. Now. That, that kind of leads me on to my next topic, which is around innovation, really. Mm. Um, it, it, everything's moving very, very fast, right? And there's new technology, there's new innovations happening almost on a daily, if not more frequent basis. What would be your advice for data leaders or anyone in this kind of space to keep up to date with the knowledge and, and, and stay, stay kind of on point with it? Yeah, it's an important dimension to, to the job. Horizon scanning, understanding what might disrupt uh, your market, for example. And we've seen a lot of that happen in the last decade. Or what tools might come online just this week, big announcements from Microsoft at the developers conference, you know, the embedding of chat GPT right across the stack, you know, vertically and horizontally, it's just everywhere. And six months ago, no one saw that coming. So it's a really good example of how rapidly something can reach a stage of technological maturity and then also increase adoption because it doesn't automatically follow that you create the best tool and everyone picks it up and finds things to do with it. The instinctive nature of generative AI as a user is what's got it adopted, mm -hmm. that any of us can go into one of those large language models and start putting in prompts and getting really interesting outputs and then slowly tuning it, going back to that concept we had right at the start. Um, right now, that's very important, uh, but it's, it's not necessarily gonna stay you know, in that realm. I think we'll, we'll see some, some shifts and we can come back to that in a minute. But on the point of horizon scanning, how does a leader stay on top of things? Well. First of all, you need to find your own trusted information sources. Right? There, there are simply too many to try to be across all of them. So you have to have a filter. Uh, I think famously when Obama was in the White House, uh, he got shown 10 emails a day. Uh, and one of his information advisors said, uh, it's not about being the, the chef looking at you know, a vast array of ingredients and choosing what to make. It's more about creating a fixed menu each day yeah. for the president to see so that he can get on and you know takes very serious yeah, uh, yeah. decisions likewise if you just want to understand what's going on find a source or a couple of sources that sort of match your take on the world mm. of course that will build in some confirmation bias but try to have you know a reasonable spread of them then make sure you've got people around you um who if they send you a link or you know, you're chatting and they go, oh, we just tried this out. Um, I'm very excited by it, take a look. You go, sure, I'll do that, right? It's the same set of people, if they recommend a film to you, you go and see it, mm -hmm. right? If, if they keep telling you about films you never go to see, find another friend to yeah. tell you about the technology. 
Uh, and actually, you know, external businesses, businesses like yourselves, uh, consultancies and agencies who are advising brands all the time are really useful for that because that's kind of your job yeah. uh, is being on, on top of these things. So you're aggregating knowledge uh, out of these huge information flows and working out what, what's really valuable. And then I think the final piece is to try to build in some learning time, R&D time for everybody. Yep. To say, you know, two hours a fortnight, you are not on the clock for the business. You're on the clock for find out what's going on. Yep. Right? Just do some research. Go and read something. Go and look at some stuff. Go to an event, whatever it might be. And then share that as well. And then come back and, you know, if there's something good or you come away with the opinion that, you know, it's not, not yeah. worth the effort. Um, that's also valuable, yeah, yeah. right? So, yeah, I mean, there's, there's too many sources, there's too many yeah. events, uh, there's just too much going for any one person to get across. The, the pace of change is incredible, but you can't go the other way and just ignore it <laughs> because it's going to come for you anyway, uh, or it will just appear in your desktop one day and you'll be like, what's that? I never saw that coming. Why is it talking to me? You know? yeah, yeah. Uh, or was it telling me something? Uh, that I didn't ask it yeah, to yeah. do. So um, it, it's not easy, but, you know, again, um, I don't mean to keep referencing my age, but it's been really interesting just seeing these waves and waves and waves of technology and trying to absorb them and understand them. And, you know, occasionally you you decide that, you know, the, the Philips videotape format was the right one. <laughs> it turns out not so much, right? Yeah. But every organization has been there. Every individual has been there. Every leader has made choices like that just hope you get better you mm. tune your own decision making and you go i think this one is worthwhile and you know we'll stick with it and we'll make it work i mean you, it's, it's fascinating listening to your answers because there's so so many different points that i can as the host of this podcast go into from there but there's one, one point that i'll pick up on is is is, is your reference to to ai now, m many years ago, big data. Do you remember big data was a, was was was, well, was a thing? Well, Wazim, let let me tell you. So the point when I got employed by Data IQ, the the term big data was just starting to take off. You know, you can you can do Google trend search, and no one was using it before mm. 2011. Um, and then suddenly it it took off. In 2012, there there were half a dozen significant reports that said, you know, McKinsey and the World Economic Forum, this is the next thing. Yeah. And and I I, I remember because I was I was I was doing some consulting myself at the time and I remembered um, and we've all seen it in the, in in our careers as, as as data people where the CEO or someone very senior in the organisation would email saying oh I've just heard of this this is quite good let's get this right. big data was one of those oh, things yes. and I remember really really clearly having a conversation with with the CEO and and I went in as a consultant and I was just like so, so how can I help really I can't remember the exact. And, and I remember him really clearly saying, I want big data. <laughs> and I was just like, well, what's, what's big data? And I feel like now AI is becoming one of those things. And, and by the way, I have to say, as, as, as someone who's kind of transitioned into role, I think I'm becoming one of those annoying CEOs who, who <laughs> message the team constantly saying, hey, I've heard of this. That's part of the job description. Yeah, yeah, I think so. It should be included. Um, but AI is definitely becoming one of those things now where actually um, it's the AI storm is all over the news and, and yeah. all of that kind of stuff. And I imagine there's a number of senior execs out there who are messaging their data professionals yeah. and their data team saying, I want AI. So what, what's, what is AI? What's, what's the definition of AI? Because that's something that I would ask, ask yeah. anyone who yeah, yeah. asked me for it. What's, okay, your, again, what's your so interpretation? Always good to, to get into it. I mean, first of all, you know, we always refer to these things as shiny new toys. Mm. And uh, CEOs, including our own, by the way, uh, do exactly that. Um, they'll be exposed to something. They'll come back and go, what's our play with this? Yeah. You know, can I have some of that? Uh, so, of course, this year, we're specifically seeing that happen with generative AI. And generative AI is one of the many, many branches of the domain of artificial intelligence, which is based on large language models, which is based on a statistical approach that says, what is the next likely word or pixel if this is the thing you're trying to create. And what's happened is the model has become incredibly effective and supported by huge compute power, which has made it globally distributed. And that's why it's taken off so fast, as I was saying earlier. Suddenly, you, everybody can have a go on, on this. 
Now, how useful is that? Well, in certain domains, it's incredibly useful. If you're tasked with creating a lot of marketing email campaigns, for example, and you need subject headers, but you need them to appeal to uh, younger women in South Korea um, or uh, older men in the United States, um, you go into one of those platforms and you say, right, write me 10 subject lines that would appeal to this, and you just keep iterating. Wonderful. I mean, that just drives your, your efficiency up. But also the benefit is quite limited because you're still doing an email campaign. Uh, you still only have a certain number of targets. You may get a better response rate, but you might have a limited volume of stock mm -hmm. that you can sell, which is where it starts to loop back into the data issues where some of the constraints will have to come in to play. A lot of that experimentation is happening way outside of the data mm -hmm. office. Sometimes the data office is tasked with things like AI governance and AI ethics and is rapidly right now trying to educate the business. Don't put commercially sensitive data into a third party public platform because mm -hmm. you just don't know for certain where it might end up. Yeah. By the way, the big platforms uh, are very rigorous about mm -hmm. protecting that and are very clear about their policies with some of the other startups and there's hundreds of them offering front ends into some of those bigger platforms or their own models. You have to be very cautious. And the data world, the data office, understands a lot of that due diligence and a lot of that governance and can be in the conversation as the people saying, yep, yeah, there's value to be created. We just need to put these guardrails around it. Mm -hmm. And it will depend on the kind of industry sector that you're in. Um, now, generative AI is a very particular thing. It's based in language models. It's not the same as general artificial intelligence, which is the thing everyone worries about. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the robot overlords coming to steal our jobs and uh, uh, you know, die puny human type fear factor. That is still a long way off. Mm -hmm. But it's just that the, the, the current chat GPT or BARD models have passed the Turing test. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't know it's not a human when you're talking to yes. it. Yes, yeah. So it's a breakthrough moment with that technology and we still don't really know how far that can take us. There are obvious benefits to be had in many, many realms and there are also you know, concerns that have to be taken seriously. For the data world, I think we will very quickly see some very domain-specific applications being brought to bear. So we're already seeing vendors, the sorts of Tableau and so on, who are deploying large language models to yeah. put context in place around an insight, to, to generate a lot more automated reporting yeah. that's absorbable, you know, driving up the data literacy because it says at this point, sales were looking like this in this market, there may have been a factor driving that. Mm -hmm. Weather, right? It was sunny, people bought more ice cream. Great, thanks for merging that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> now I've got an understanding of what's going on yeah. in my marketplace. Uh, so, I, so I think that again, you know, that will be the technology being tuned into specific domains out of the, the very generic platforms that we see right now because if you just use a generic platform, you'll get a generic benefit yeah, yeah. and it will homogenize everything. And what we need to see is the arrival of heterogeneous AI, and that will be very specific to a domain, to an organization as well. And to really make that happen, you are still gonna need your analysts and your data scientists and the business intelligence, uh, sorry, the understanding of the business yeah. to go, that's good, that's bad, more of this, less of that. Yeah, absolutely right. Yeah, look, I com I completely agree on that, and and I think that's one a of relief, the, by yeah. the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, it it it's it's really interesting. It's a really really hot topic, and 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 I'm I'm sure you do as well. But but there's a lot of an appro uh, approach from journalists at the moment around uh, what's your view on this, what's your yeah. view on it, and it's all around AI. Um, and and without naming organisations, you are seeing organisations doing layoffs at the moment. It's a tough market, but they're doing layoffs and yeah. actually claiming to replace some of their staff with with AI um, as a result of it. And I know efficiency is one of the things that you mentioned when you were talking about AI and generative AI. Um, I, I, 
what what's your take on that and and where does where does regulation play a part to an extent but where does ethics play a part because because for me actually are we going to be re- replacing humans with 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 robots what's your take how how do, you, how do you think the workforce dynamic will change as a result of it well i think it's important to remember that sometimes a convenient excuse arrives for things like headcount reduction yep. so all technologies all large technology organizations have been looking to reduce their headcount because of you know reduction in expenditure whether that's from digital advertising or you know investment into new infrastructure by their client base and so naturally they want to be able to spin a narrative as to why this is happening and if they can blame it on a technology possibly even the same one that they themselves have created <laughs> then uh, they'll do that. Of course they will. Now, does that mean the technology really has replaced the job? In some cases, yes. I think it's, it's, it's an unavoidable truth. There are certain roles which have involved a lot of manual processes or a lot of quite low-level decision-making where automating that should give you better decisions, allow you to move quicker, uh, and probably at a lower cost. Although, again, that tends to be a hidden truth. Yep. Um, right now, there's a big benefit from very low cost or free use of these tools, but they will be monetizing the hell out of them very, very soon. And much as you know, cloud platforms were the answer to a lot of problems and the reason to reduce IT expenditure and, and the number of people employed in the IT function, now, of course, the overhead of cloud platforms uh, is pretty significant, um, but it, you, know, you can just run a lot more things in cloud and have a new generation of technologists who well, cloud are cloud experts. Are cloud experts, right? Yeah. So it's very paradoxical. I saw this, um, th- this article that suggested uh, you know, the hottest job at the moment is prompt engineer, and certain employers were offering you know, literally hundreds of thousands of dollars for someone. Well. Great, take that job if you can get it because you'll be out of a job in 18 to 24 months because the very thing that prompt engineers are creating is libraries of prompts that you can search in to find you know, things that will enhance your use of generative AI. But as soon as those libraries exist and then themselves get automated, you won't need prompt engineers. So take the money now. It's a bit like being a, you know, a great striker. It's, it's terrific until you know, you, you, your meta will breaks yeah. and you're out of the game for a long time you need the money up front um so uh other jobs that are at risk tend to be the the lesser skilled white collar roles and this probably is the first technology we've seen that threatens white collar work mm-hmm. and therefore a middle class that relatively recently in our history have assumed uh their jobs were for life so if you're an accountant or a teacher or a lawyer, there is going to be a lot of AI interacting with your pupils, your clients, um, the, the, the daily interface, mm-hmm. because it can more rapidly absorb information and regurgitate it out yep. to those people in an absorbable way. Now, that's a useful development tool as well. Uh, and we know quite a number of law firms who are working on their proposition for clients using AI, but still requiring a lawyer because ultimately our judicial system requires an individual to be responsible. Yeah, yeah. And that means there will always be a human in the loop. There just might be fewer of them than there were. Will new jobs arise off the back of that? Almost certainly. Uh, but remember that technology businesses are not there to create employment. They're mm-hmm. there to create profits. Mm-hmm. So I wouldn't necessarily look to them to support the displaced. Uh, Italy has set aside a significant amount of money to support people who do lose their jobs through AI. Don't know exactly what they're going to get them to do. Um, perversely, you, know, you can't get people to work in fields. Mm-hmm. So we want the automation there. Yeah. People want to work in nice digital offices, and that's where the automation is happening right now. So uh, it's, it's complex times. Um, I'm perhaps 
grateful to be at this end of my career, not at the start, because I'm <laughs> not sure. It's the third sure. time you reference your, your age. I know. Well, yeah. <laughs> it's just something that happens. Yeah. And you have to be realistic that there are more vintages in the <laughs> cellar than there are in the vineyards, you know. But the, the sort of things that, that I did early in my career as a journalist um, just don't have value yeah. now. You know, the, the, the simple uh, chasing after stories and writing them up and publishing them, you know, in print, um, that can just be automated and out in seconds. Yeah. Uh, it, 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 it's, it's interesting because actually I, I remember um, as, I, as I've gone through my career, we, we, I've, I've, I've answered this question a number of times on mm -hmm. different innovations that have come up in, in the data and tech space, yeah. right? And oh, will I lose my job or will I do that? And, and I remember actually doing a, a, a huge campaign um, with a colleague of mine around demystifying these these buzzwords or, or the shiny new toys, as yep. you say as well. Um, what what's the what? Th there's an opportunity, and I always speak to people about actually don't think about your uh, don't think about the the losing of the job. Think about the the opportunity to learn something new or or or, or change career. What what? And I feel like data leaders have a big part to play in this, yeah. especially as if AI does come in and and it is replacing certain mm -hmm. certain uh, jobs or people in in, in certain tasks. But actually, I feel data leaders have a huge part to play in line with data literacy and education to upskill individuals yeah. in order to do certain 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 different tasks, perhaps. What's 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 kind of your take on that, I guess? I think that's right. Um, I, I, I spoke earlier about uh, things like the Microsoft Builds yep. conference yep. where they talk to their developers and they reveal what, what's happening. And it's very striking the the language they use and the excitement they have about the opportunity and talk about anyone in the world can now be a developer. Yep. You don't need necessarily coding skills because generative AI can write code for you. Mm. Uh, now, that's a huge opportunity to, to think about you know, innovating, even at the level of a simple process you might have done every single day of your working life up to now. You could work out a piece of code that, that does that and releases you to do something far more value creating that you can then go to your business and say, we could do this, right? I've worked this out. We've got all the assets. We've got this, this opportunity. There's a gap in the market. Mm -hmm. And I think there are the two sides that, that data leaders can support. One is critical thinking. So really drill into an issue, understand the root causes, the opportunities, the, the, the data that you might need to assemble um, so that when you're challenged about it, you have an answer mm. and people will trust that you thought it through. Mm. And the second is have the confidence to engage with the technology, with the data and with your business in that way. And I think the second part is the hard of it for most data leaders or most leaders generally, because dealing with people, dealing with humans won't get automated. Yep. Hiring and firing, you can automate. Right. I mean, the firing bit probably will get automated because <laughs> no one wants to do that. But actually managing people day to day, the human touch is really where productivity takes off. Because if you create the right culture, create the right data culture, if you embed the data literacy, people want to do things well. They get rewarded for it because the business is growing and mm -hmm. thriving. And they enjoy working not just for the organization, but with their colleagues and with you as a, as a leader. That's quite a challenge yeah. because, after all, not many people and not many organizations have ever managed to get that right. Yeah. Or they get it right and then they get acquired or something fundamental shifts in, in their market. Uh, so it's for the leader as much about their own learning and development, you know, lifelong development as you're constantly advocating, don't get complacent about skill set, mm -hmm. but also trust some of what you are good at, yeah, yeah. right? Don't assume it's all got to be about the new. Mm -hmm. Other things don't change as fast. And one of them is human emotions, yep. you know, uh, the drivers of human behavior, the reasons why people sometimes come to work and they're not doing so well. Uh, and you've got to deal with that or how you unpick when an analyst says, I really don't want to do anything on data quality today. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's happening every single day, yeah, yeah, by yeah. the way, yeah, yeah. I'm sure you know. Um, how do you deal with that? You've done it so many times. 
But then how do you embed that understanding further down into the people who report to you and the people that they're managing? And that's what I think makes the job exciting. Sure, we've got all the new toys coming through, you know, all the data becoming more accessible, uh, the business is listening, um, but ultimately individuals have to do these things. Yeah. Just like the CEO has got to make the call, the data leader's got to create the culture. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm completely with you. And 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 look, just just we're, we're we're fast running out of time, so I've got a couple more questions. That I'm desperate Go to for ask it. you. So yeah, um, I, I'll, I'll I, give you shorter answers. No, no, you're, I think <laughs> I think I think it's brilliant. We could go on for hours, really, on this on, on these topics. Um, we we've seen the kind of uh, I don't want to call it evolu evolution, but it is in a way of the the data leader. Let's not call yeah. them something in particular, but the data leader over time. I remember early in my career. I, I, the, as a data person, I used to be in a separate room to everyone else. I needed oh, yeah. a special pass to get in. It was absolutely hilarious because other people couldn't get into it. We were literally locked in a room. Um, so, so the data leader has gone from being a, almost a Cody technology type person to actually having to be more a human sales type person because they're trying to win the organization. Um, and that's probably happened over the past 15 years or so, I would say. Yeah. Um, what do you think the next 15 years looks like? What's the evolution of, of the data leader? Is it, is, are we not going to have a data leader in 15 years? Is it, more, is it going to be a chief AI officer or whatever it may be? What, what's, your, what's your kind of prediction if you were to make one? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. Of course, predictions are always <laughs> perilous. I think there's a useful model for this. And it's actually from the finance department. Uh, so, so back in the 1980s, Finance departments were literally about where's the cash? Have we done the tax return? Have we done the report to the, to the city or to the shareholders? And then businesses started to float on stock markets. And the finance director had to account for the difference between the physical assets and the share price, right? Where's the value in this business? And it transformed the finance director to a CFO. And the CFO is generally the second most powerful person in any business. Because they're the ones who can say, well, all the values in these patents or the brand or you know, whatever it might be that the business has that is now being valued so highly. It might be you know, predicted future revenues and can we confidently do all of that? I think the, the CDO, the CDAO, the CDAIO, whatever they're called, the, the, the actual term is less important mm -hmm. than the fact that they are going to be playing a similar role. Are we confident that we will have the right data flows, the trusted data, the ability to feed that into our processes to drive the things that the business is trying to do? And if so, what kind of value is that going to create? And that value is not just pounds and pence. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's often... Uh, increased levels of engagement or reduction in uh, you know, employee dissatisfaction, churn, things like that, that often come about from better tooling, uh, better use of data, better, higher data literacy. So like I said, originally I thought the journey might be towards being data native and, and the, the complete dilution of that boundary. That may yet happen. Mm -hmm. And it may be that you'll see boardrooms where every single person around the table, at some level you could describe as a CDO or CDAO, yeah. right? Um, and that would be really interesting, but that won't suit everywhere. Yeah, but there will have to be someone who is answerable for the fundamental building blocks of data yeah. that support that organization. Yeah. And unless they're there, unless they're able to say, we can't use that anymore. This is going to trip us up or here's a great opportunity. Let's do more of it. Then the decisions that get made will not drive the business forward. Yeah. So what are they going to be called? <sighs> I, 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 really, I really don't know. I think we've got too much convergence taking place. I'll, I'll say there'll be a C and there'll be an O. <laughs> um, you can pick any number of words to put in there, but I, I suspect data won't be in there. It won't yeah. be called out. Mm -hmm. um, maybe it'll be chief process officer. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. Um, you know, language in this domain is moving fast. Very fast. Yeah. yeah. Agreed. Agreed. And and your to to your point, you're you're or not enough, but you're already starting to see board makeups 
having data people on them and, and CDOs on yeah. them. And often CDOs who are C, uh, who I call seasoned CDOs who have done a few rounds yeah. are on the board of another organization as almost a second yeah. job. Yeah. Um, and you're seeing that more and more often, which I think is great, actually. And I think yeah. it's good to have that kind of data uh, uh, data person around the, around the table on that. Um, so, so one thing that, that, that I wanted to ask you, and this is, this is probably less for the seasoned CDOs, more for the new CDO. So, yeah, so actually there's, there's a few, uh, there, there's a number of people who are just stepping into this data leader type role. They've progressed in their career. They finally got there. Um, what would, what would be the tips? What, what would you say? Cause you, you, you talk to, to very experienced people from, from the data IQ 100 on a, on almost a daily basis, I imagine. Yeah. What would be the three tips or the three things that you'd say to a very a new person in 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 the role um, around everything we've spoken about AI, data literacy? Sure. What are the three yeah. things that you would give? Uh, so I think number one, don't get hung up on a coding language or a, a tech stack. Right, um, you might find an initial advantage by being an expert on it that gets you into the role, but assume that fairly rapidly something else will come along that replaces that. And uh, it will be less important in the future to understand those languages mm -hmm. uh, or to work within a specific stack. Mm -hmm. uh, number two, ask challenging questions. Yeah. It's not an easy thing to do, but every time someone says to you, right, we are doing this or we're changing that, just say, why? What's the benefit, right? What's the value? Uh, and three, um, be a team player. Because data is certainly a team sport. No one person can be across everything that it encompasses. Businesses need team players. You know, going back to the sports analogy, you might have a superstar striker, but unless they're getting the assists, unless the midfield is holding off the opposition, unless the defenders are feeding the midfield, unless the goalie is playing yeah. it out from the back, you will never score a goal. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Be part of the team. It's very much a team sport, absolutely. And and as as, as part of this podcast, we're we're, we're going to be talking to individuals like yourself and data leaders. Hopefully, a few a number of different data leaders to get their perspective on the on the wonderful world of data and, and everything that surrounds it as well. What would be as as a final question on this podcast? What what would be the one question that you want answered from a data leader? And and what I'll, what I'll try and do in, in in the following podcast is ask them that question. What would be the one question you want to ask? How do you cope? <laughs> to the question that we were just discussing, the, 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 the breadth of this domain, the, the pace of change, how do you cope with that? It's, you know, the, the job, you, you touched on it with your own role, was he? it? It's changing out of all proportion mm -hmm. and so fast and, and the skill set. So I mean that at a personal level. Uh, we at Data IQ are trying to be there for people and support them and looking at, you know, all these additional things like mentoring and, and yeah. coaching and, and so on, because that has not been something that data people have had in their lives, but other executives do. Yeah. So it's really important to not feel you've got to be able to answer every question uh, or that you can't say, I don't know, and be vulnerable in that role. And part of coping is allowing yourself to be vulnerable and getting support. Yeah. And when your new team member asks you that challenging question, go, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. You tell me. Yeah, what yeah. do you think is going to come out of it? Yeah. Because the great thing is, democratization of data, democratization of tools like generative AI, the answer could come from anywhere. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And we'll, we'll, put, that, we'll put that question forwards to, 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 to um, people on the podcast as they, as they go forwards. But I think, I think to your point, being vulnerable is actually a really good leadership trait in my yes. view. Um, you, you don't want to, in my view, and, and I'm no expert in, in any ways, but when I manage teams, actually showing that vulnerability massively helps your teams. And as a data leader, if you can show that, um, you're setting the right example, Correct. I think, rather than almost just being a robot. Um, we'll leave that to the AI. And, and, but but um, <laughs> it, it's showing that vulnerability and showing that humanness about it. So I, I, I make a point around telling my team when I have a day off, um, as an example, it's a really small thing. So I had a day off, I went to the zoo with my son. Yeah. And, and I make a point of doing that because I think it's really important to know that actually I needed that day off. I needed yeah. that break. That's great to hear. Yeah. Set um, the example. 
David, look, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Uh, it was great to have you. Great conversation. We could have gone on for hours. We could, Wazim. It's been I, a pleasure. Thank you very I much. I will for invite you me. back when the second book is written. You've heard it here first. <laughs> oh, there's a challenge. <laughs> so I'll invite you back with the second book and, and, and I'll come with my own copy next time as well. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to today's episode brought to you by the Harnham Group. We'd love it if you would share the podcast on social media and leave a comment or a review to help us reach a bigger audience. If your company is having difficulty finding skilled data professionals, you can rely on the global leader in data and analytics recruitment, staffing and talent development to assist you with your hiring needs. Find out more at www.harnham.com. Thank you for listening.